There's an old saying in the news business, if it bleeds, it leads. It's a somewhat gruesome notion, but to look across the headlines and top stories today, there's plenty of it. War, pandemic, natural disasters, and crime. And new research shows it's having the opposite effect on viewership that it maybe once did. With us now on why people seem to be increasingly tuning out the news. And as is our custom, we're going to introduce our guest from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in San Francisco, California, with Adam Mastroianni, postdoctoral fellow at the Columbia School of Business. In Washington, D.C., investigative journalist Amanda Ripley, who writes for The Atlantic, Politico, and The Washington Post, among others, and whose latest book is called High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. And in Quebec City, Quebec, Colette Brun, director of the Center for Media Studies at Laval University, and we are delighted to welcome the three of you to our program tonight uh, for a subject that uh, is causing plenty of uh, consternation, I can tell you, at places like this, which are presumably in the business of trying to attract viewership, and... Um, and what you've suggested challenges that. So, Amanda, let's get started here. Earlier this summer, you did an op-ed about the fact that you no longer read the news. Um, you're a journalist, Amanda. Isn't that a bit like a priest confessing that they no longer believe in God? <laughs> yes, it is. It was a very embarrassing and shameful feeling for years. I actually do still read the news, but I had to cut way back. I no longer watch the news, which I probably shouldn't admit on this show. Uh, but yeah, I found that I really would uh, be depleted and drained after my usual morning news diet, which was quite heavy um, for many years. I mean, I was a journalist and I had to read a lot of news, but about five or six years ago, it just seemed like I couldn't function very well after I read the news. So I kept pushing it to later in the day, you know, thinking that if I just waited till sundown, like a vampire, that maybe then would be the right time to consume the news. And for years, this went on until like other journalist friends of mine started saying that they too had to limit their news consumption. And finally, I started thinking that maybe it wasn't just that I had gone soft, uh, although that's probably part of it, but also the way the news is framed and delivered and selected is, is often, I think, designed to make us insane, even if it's not always intentional. Well, we'll follow up more on this in a bit, but I just want to understand. So you're telling me you watch no, sort of like the 6.30 American Network newscast, you don't watch that, you don't watch any of the primetime lineups of CNN, MSNBC, like you don't do that? Never, not for years, no. And, and that's, I mean, to be fair, you know, my job doesn't require me to do that. Your job does, right? So it depends on the person. But also there's a lot of research that Taking the news in through the video format is just much more, um, much harder on you uh, cognitively and spiritually than reading it. Well, Adam knows what you're talking about because he wrote a piece uh, earlier this year uh, comparing news consumption to nicotine addiction. Adam, why don't you make the case for us here? How are they the same? So it used to be that people would start their day with a nice cigarette uh, and people would think, that's a totally fine way to live your life. Uh, that's a good uh, down-home tradition for everybody. And then we found out that uh, that shortens your life. Um, and I think we are discovering the same thing about news consumption, that this thing that we used to see as, um, as almost a patriotic duty uh, is, in fact, I think, driving us apart and making us feel insane. Um, so I had a similar experience to Amanda. I, uh, during the Trump administration, I was reading a lot of news, and I would imagine myself throttling a Trump supporter, uh, most most often my brother-in-law. And then I thought to myself, I don't want to live like this. Uh, and, and I stopped. And then it felt like a war that used to be fought in my head was now being fought on Neptune instead. Um, and it was a much, much better feeling. And, and gen I mean, we know for a fact that smoking will shorten your life. Do you believe that, that overconsumption of news will also shorten your life? I wouldn't go so far as to say it's as bad as, as lighting up a cigarette. But it is the case that living your life in, in a state of chronic stress isn't good for you. Um, so, uh, so I also don't think it's going to make you live longer either. Hmm. Colette, you study media consumption in Canada, and I wonder whether you can tell us whether media consumption is declining in Canada. Well, we do find... Um that there is a higher level of news avoidance. So the digital news report this year, which Amanda cited in her, her article, uh, found that in, in most markets, including Canada, uh, people who said they were avoiding news, at least sometimes, 
uh, was up. So we're about at 42% of people say they'll they'll uh, avoid it sometimes or often, and 71%, including occasionally. So that may seem like a lot for a journalist, but it's probably, as your previous guest said, uh, pretty healthy, uh, considering that news is now something that we have to avoid. It, it wasn't always the case. And do they give explanations as to why they are avoiding the news? Well, the, the most often cited reasons from a list that we gave them is uh, are uh, the negative effect on their mood uh, and the fact that there's too much news on topics like politics and COVID. So this survey was done in, in the early months of the year. This was the, during the throes of the, the convoy protests in Canada, which may explain, explain some of that um, and, and the context generally of, you know, the pandemic fatigue and, uh, well, there wasn't the war on Ukraine yet, but... Um, uh, just the, the the sense that things in the world are, are somewhat depressing right now. So, you know, I, I hear my my colleagues in the in the U.S. Uh, and I sympathize with what you had to go through. Um, but we do see similar things in Canada. And one more follow up: Do you, do you believe there is a correlation between less news consumption and less trust for legacy media? Well, there certainly is in our findings, uh, and we do see that trust is also going down. Um, and, and actually, that's one of the answers that people gave for not for avoiding the news is that they found that news was untrustworthy and biased. Hmm. Amanda, you told us earlier about what you are no longer prepared to watch. I want to get a sense of what your media diet was like when you were, I guess by today's standards, overindulging. What was the day like for you? Well, I would read three newspapers. I would keep CNN on, on mute in my office at Time Magazine. I would listen to NPR, uh, public radio here in the States as I got ready in the morning. Uh, and you know, the biggest difference was that I enjoyed it. Like I felt like it made me more curious, not less. And I think that's the shift that I felt happening, that it, it made me feel worse. It made me feel less curious. I felt like I could scroll through most headlines in the New York Times, and I knew what they were going to say. Uh, there was a lot of catastrophizing and also a lot of very objectively hard, painful news, right? So I think it's many things at once. And, and also the fact that the news is just everywhere all the time. It's been aerosolized, right? Like you can't avoid it. So it's, it's a very different experience than it was. And I really miss that. And I naively probably hope to get back to it. I actually think there is a way to deliver the news and frame the news that is designed for human consumption. And I just think journalism has to evolve. Was there one incident in particular that made you say, okay, this is too much for me now and I gotta scale back? I would say uh, I was one of the school shootings. It's hard to pick one because there's so many, unfortunately, here in the US. But reading about those school shootings is just so gutting and so, you feel so hopeless uh, here that you just, you have nothing to do with that energy, right? Like it is important to feel anger and to feel pain and to feel sadness. That is very important. Uh, but it is also important to convert those into something useful. And what I find is that the focus, the sort of relentless focus on the negative and on despair leaves us with nowhere to go. Now, I will say there are exceptions to this. And there are journalists and even news outlets that are doing this differently. Um, and they leave you with, they, they do look at the hard stories and they leave you with a sense that, you know, there are people trying to work on this. And even if you personally can't fix it, which would be nice, uh, there are people elsewhere trying to work on this. And it just makes it so that you can kind of get up and get out of bed, right? Which is important. I think we can all agree. Did you seek therapy for what was becoming an increasingly problematic thing for you? I did. I asked my therapist, I was like, look, I used to cover terrorism and crime and disasters and I cover conflict now. I can't, I can't not read the news. Like, what is wrong with me? Uh, and she, it was like I had developed an allergy to the news and I wanted some kind of medication. And she said, well, I have the answer. Stop reading the news. And I said, well... I don't feel like that's a great option. Like I want to be informed, you know, and even putting aside my work, I feel like it's important to know what's going on in the world. And it was such a core part of my identity for decades that it was unimaginable to totally give it up. And I still, I still feel that way. Um, 
But I, I do think that some of the onus here is on journalists to do this differently. And so I spent the past year just trying to interview people who understand what humans really need to make sense of the world and what we're not getting from the news. Um, and, and I think for me, those things are hope, agency, and dignity. I'm sure other people have other ideas, but I think that's the most exciting piece of this is, you know, how could this be better? We're going to come back to that in a moment. But, Adam, I want to get a sense from you. Uh, again, in your overindulgent days, what was a typical day for you in terms of news consumption? Oh, I would scroll, 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 baby. Uh, <laughs> I'd have this feeling that if I, could just, if I could just scroll to the end, then maybe all the problems would go away, that they were, in fact, problems because I hadn't read the headlines yet. Um, so I'd load up a news app on my phone in the morning or it uh, breaks at work. Uh, I'd listen to podcasts while I was running. Um, uh, I'd save articles to my phone. Um, I wouldn't so much call it, a, uh, an information diet as it was sort of an information, all you can eat buffet. And how did it make you feel? Bad. Um, the, just this sense of, uh, much like Amanda said, um, I feel bad about these things, but I'm one person among billions. What am I going to do? Um, and I realized too, it was distracting me from, the actual things that I could do, um, and I think we all could do, we're, we're embedded in social networks in our lives where we have a lot of power. Um, we, each of us, no matter who we are, have the power every day to make the, the lives of the people around us much better or much worse, depending on what we do. So I'm a teacher, I'm a researcher, um, I'm a member of a family, I have a partner. All of those people are counting on me to be the best version of myself, and I won't do that if I am worried about problems that I can't solve and just going over and over again uh, on them in my head. And how do you feel now that you've cut way back? I feel great. Um, and it's also not that I don't take in information. Um, so I still read a ton of, of stuff. So I, uh, I write a blog on Substack. I read a bunch of other people who are writing there, neuroscientists, economists. Um, and so I feel like this idea of to be informed means means to read the news or to watch the news, I think is a huge PR victory for the news. And I think it's totally wrong that uh, there's so much information out there that isn't going to be delivered to you in the, um, in the format of here's what happened today. Because often the most important things are things that happened long ago. Uh, and so I also read a lot of history as well. Hmm. Colette, who avoids the news more, men or women? Uh, in Canada, it tends to be women, and women also have uh, different reasons for avoiding the news. Uh, they, they do cite more um, that it affects their mood. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting to hear uh, these, these guests who are finally not really completely avoiding the news, but trying to get a, a more healthy diet. It's a little bit like saying, well, I'm soaring off love because of Tinder. <laughs> um, just to make kind of a, maybe a bad analogy. But uh, I think it, what really needs to be pointed out is that the online environment is really quite toxic. Um, and, you know, just being on your screen all the time scrolling is probably not the best way to consume news. We all know that. But uh, it's hard to make a real, as, as a news consumer, it's hard to, to really filter your choices and, and make those smart uh, you know, have a good, healthy uh, news diet in, in this environment. It, it requires a lot of effort, I think. No, there's no question the online environment in terms of comments you might see on Twitter or underneath a YouTube video or something like that, some of that can be just appallingly awful. But do people, in your experience, not make the distinction between those comments and... OK, let me put it this way. You know, reputable pieces by reputable legacy organizations that supposedly have some trust and distinctiveness attached to them? Well, it really depends uh, who, whom, uh, to whom you ask the question. Uh, for, some, for many people, uh, those traditionally reputable sources are the people that they consider the most uh, you know, problematic. Uh, and there is a, lot, a high level in distru of distrust towards uh, traditional news media in certain parts of the population. So I don't think we should ignore that. Um, and, and the fact that we consume this all in these bits and pieces that are just kind of bombarded at us, of course, for people who are experts, for expert journalists or expert analysts, uh, they, they do know the difference. But for the typical user, and I would say even, even for myself, it's the overall experience of having all of that kind of thrown at you. And it's hard to really kind of focus on, on those bits that are more um, 
empowering or, or, you know, generating more hate. We do, as human beings, tend to focus on whatever stimulates negative emotions, like anger, fear, despair. Uh, it's unhealthy, uh, but there are, you know, survival reasons why we do this. Uh, so we have to learn to consume news differently. And I think our two guests are really, your two other guests are really good examples of that. Well, you say differently. Let me ask you, have you cut back in the kind of, in the amount of news that you consume? Uh, mostly as uh, because of time constraints. Uh, I mean, I'm a journalism professor, so I would be like a gym teacher saying, you know, don't exercise. So um, I, I try to consume news smarter. Uh, for sure, television is not a big part of my diet. I tend to watch over my shoulder when my uh, partner is watching um, uh, political commentary on on, on the daily uh, on the news channels, uh, mostly in French, I must say, in Quebec, so uh, RDI and LCN. Uh, and I think it's good to have kind of a, a general knowledge of that uh, environment, but for sure to be, uh, you know, bathing in CNN and Fox every day, uh, I, I would feel, I would not feel very good about myself. I no, I, I appreciate that there's got to be a, a healthy limit to how much of this you can take in, but I, I mean, Adam, let me go to you on this. You know, we are living in extremely consequential times. We talked about it off the top. You know, we're still getting over a global pandemic. Uh, there is a terrible war in Eastern Europe. Uh, there is crime, the, the climate change. We're seeing disasters upon disasters. Amanda referred to the fact that there seems to be a school shooting in your country. Uh, well, I won't say how often, but it's far too often. Let's put it that way. Do, is there not a part of you that feels, I am missing something if I don't indulge more than I currently am. Yeah, I would say uh, two things to that. One is, um, even if you don't purposely seek out the news, it finds you anyway. So, uh, <laughs> so I still know the things that are going on. Um, uh, it's impossible to avoid them. And second, I think there are ways of learning about all the important things that are happening in the world that don't rely on, uh, uh, on engaging with them in the news every day. Um, so for instance, if you wanna understand um, how the financial system works, you shouldn't check the stock market every day. Um, you should find someone who writes very cogently about this and follow them. Um, and that's what I do. So this idea that important things are happening every day, I think is actually very misleading. And when I started only checking the headlines once a week, I realized that so many of the things that seemed so important last week turned out to just be noise. Um, and much like checking stocks every day, you're going to be misled if you're always looking at every up and down instead of stepping back and going, what are actually the important events that are unfolding over time? There has, Amanda, been some deeply concerning saber rattling between Russia and the United States over the last few weeks as it relates to the potential use of nuclear weapons in Eastern Europe. And I wonder whether or not, you know, do you feel you are missing something by not watching the news to stay on top of what could be a life and death story for so many Americans? I do not. No, I think there's like stages that you go through. I don't know if Adam feels this way, but at first I feel like I felt like that. And that's why I would check it all the time. And I think, especially during the darkest days of the pandemic, I would check it, I think with the subconscious hope that I would find out things were getting better. And then I read this study that came out that looked at um, the negativity of mainstream media coverage of COVID in the United States and found that it was more negative than scientific journals coverage of COVID and more negative than international news coverage. And that even when there was some glimmer of hope, you know, vaccines were working, uh, caseloads went down, the negativity did not really abate. So I started to feel like, you know, I'm searching for something I'm not going to find here. Um, so, of course, I am continuing to keep abreast of important news stories like Ukraine. Again, like Adam, I've had to admit that my monitoring the situation doesn't make it better. Hmm. I think there's a trick of the mind where you feel like if I can just keep on top of this, I will protect myself from this horror. And it's just simply not the case. And in the meantime, you know, you can be sacrificing the small opportunities that you do have to make a difference, to be useful. And I, I think the important thing we sometimes forget is, you know, you're only getting half the news. It's not the full story. It's just not. I mean, I've literally spent my whole life creating the news. And it's not that people are, 
you know, intentionally cutting out hope, agency, and dignity. But the conventions of journalism and the financial pressures of traditional journalism make it so that I think there's sometimes a tendency to uh, have a distorted picture on the world. And so you miss important things. You know, I've started looking uh, for hope ghosts in stories, is how I think of them. You know, little things that got cut from the story, and I know this because I've done it, right? So things that got cut from the story that should have maybe been kept in, and then um, try to research them on my own, because that is a fuller picture of reality. So if we want to be informed, we have to do this differently. Here's a excerpt from a blog that Adam wrote earlier this year. Adam, you wrote, I would reluctantly keep reading about bad stuff if that somehow made it go away. But no matter how much I read, bad stuff keeps coming. Which makes sense, because it's not like the news actually led me to do anything about the bad stuff. It kind of felt like my big contribution to the cause was reading and feeling bad. It was like I was floating above all the victims of every bad thing, going, don't worry, everybody, I'm here to read <laughs> all about you and feel awful. <laughs> Uh, that's very funny, although it makes a very serious point. Um, but, okay, here's the semi-serious question that comes out of it. Your exposure to all of those terrible things and your ingesting it presumably gave you a level of heightened empathy for the people who were going through all these things. Are you concerned you are now depriving yourself of that empathy because you're no longer exposing yourself to those stories? Oh, I think that empathy really comes from deep engagement with a story rather than scrolling through and seeing like, oh man, there's some bad thing happening somewhere. I sure feel bad about that. So it's not that I won't read anything that resembles news at all. I really like long form pieces where you really get to spend some time with a story. And the point isn't communicating that some new bad thing has happened. It's trying to understand the long-term trends that have created this event, how people are experiencing it, um, what's going on there. Um, and so I think almost we need a different word for that kind of long form journalism that, uh, that yeah, it still is about things happening. Um, but the point isn't kind of this horse race coverage uh, of, of each new tragedy that's emerging every day. So so I still feel like I get empathy from that. And in fact, more from just dipping my toe in the news every day. Is this a problem, Adam, that could be solved if the legacy media simply covered more good so-called good news stories? I mean, I, I don't think so, in part because, I mean, there's a reason why news is the way that it is. Uh, they have analytics on the back. They know what people click on. And so, sure, you could write about every new cute puppy that's born, um, uh, and people will click on that a little bit. But people want to know about the bad things, um, uh, just like you want that next hit of a cigarette. Um, you want that next hit of outrage. It beca can, can become addicting. Um, and so I think the solution isn't necessarily to change the tenor of the news. I think it may be to change the depth. Um, that if you can get a better sense of what stories really matter and get into them more deeply, which I think means less information uh, overall, but more depth to the information that you have. I take your point, but I want to follow up on this notion of, uh, of whether good news is the way we've got to go here. And Colette, to that end, there is actually something called the Good News Network. It is an example of something that is trying to shine the spotlight on more good news stories. And here's an example of some recent headlines. Uh, meditation could protect older people against Alzheimer's was one headline. 70 vultures released into Bulgaria to start wild population after dying out 60 years ago. That sounds like good news. One more here. He taught parents how to play drums and bass so he'd have people to jam with. That sounds like a fun story. Um, I guess my question for you, Colette, is do people really prefer this to a steady drumbeat of negativity? Um, for sure, there is a, an audience. I think there would be more of a niche audience for these kinds of um, news platforms. But uh, I'm more interested in something more similar to uh, what um, Amanda was referring to, uh, the, con the type of content, and, and also, Adam, the type of content that, that's more explanatory, that's more uh, what's called solutions journalism, which is not the same as good news, just kind of happy news. Uh, it's much more nuanced than that. It talks about problems, but it also gives you 
some some sense of hope or possibility that these problems can be resolved. Uh, and it's much more evidence based, and it's but it's m maybe more of an effort for the audience. I mean, so it's maybe more of a, a highbrow product. Uh, but there is some evidence that uh, some forms, some lighter forms of solutions journalism, especially on climate change, uh, can actually uh, be an interesting business model as well. Now, presumably, though, Colette, the the, the major networks know this. They understand that a relentless diet of awful negativity is going to turn people off. Is that not changing their behavior at all? I mean, you, the behavior of the, the news companies? Indeed, the, the... and what they choose to cover and how they cover it, etc. Uh, I, I think they're, my, my sense of the, the news industry is that they're not... Um... They're, they're trying to, to juggle all kinds of competing obligations and, and, and con contradictions in what people say they do, what people say they want, and what they actually click on. So for sure, uh, the negative, and, and it's actually part of the news mission to talk about what's wrong in the world or what's not going well in the world. Otherwise, that would be more PR, I guess, than, than news. Um, but, and it's also a good way to get clicks, but in the long term, it does turn people off. So I, I'm not sure there is enough attention by the news industry to this problem, uh, you know, and, and I'm not sure there's an easy solution either. Well, let's so that's not- That's the easy answer. Sure, Let, let's us not be relentlessly negative about this. In our remaining moments here, let's talk about uh, what we might do about this. And uh, to that end, Amanda, you've quoted Krista Tippett, the host of On Being, that podcast, who said, I don't actually think we are equipped physiologically or mentally to be delivered catastrophic and confusing news and pictures 24-7. We are analog creatures in a digital world. Okay, if that's true, Amanda, what do you want to do about this? Yeah, so I think this idea that we've either got to have what we've got now or puppies all the time is a false dichotomy. I really am not interested in good news stories that are sort of plucked from obscurity. I think there is a way to do serious, rigorous reporting on in, in really important, complicated problems, but do it with a wider lens. So let me give you a quick example um, and a contrast. So last year, the New York Times did a major multimedia project called Postcards from a World on Fire chronicling how climate change has altered life in 193 countries. It was a very expensive, uh, labor-intensive project. There was a graphic they created of the Earth in flames, spinning in space. Um, it was incredibly depressing, demoralizing, and paralyzing, in my view. And the same newspaper, not that much later, did uh, another large story on homelessness and focused on how the city of Houston, Texas, had moved 25,000 people experiencing homelessness into homes. And how did they do it? And it wasn't easy. And there's still problems. And you know, it was rigorously reported. But it was looking at attempts to solve problems, not just marinating in the problem, right? So the interesting thing about that is it leaves you with uh, a question which is, why isn't my city doing what the city of Houston did? So it can create opportunities to hold your own politicians accountable uh, for what they're doing on hard problems. And it doesn't just leave you feeling like puppies are awesome. You know, there's an actual, <laughs> there's an actual positive good. And I think, look, in addition to all the important um, competing interests that Colette mentioned, which are real, I think journalists are just like us. Like, I, I, they are us, right? I mean, just like Adam feeling like, if I read the news, it will get better. Journalists often feel like if I can create such a horrific eye-catching story, then it will get better. If I can just show you how bad things are. And that is clearly not working. And it's actually having the opposite effect. So some of this is the conventions of legacy media need to evolve for human psychology and for reality. Adam, last word to you on this. What can we do to make things better? I think on an individual level, because that's where each of us uh, have some power, we can think of, um, uh, I mean, I use this this uh, metaphor in, in the piece, uh, we can think of gardening your mind, which maybe sounds a little woo, but I do believe in it, <laughs> that just like you can't eat everything that's put in front of you, um, you know, we evolved in a place where, uh, where there wasn't enough food to go around, and so you didn't have to choose what to eat and not to eat, you just had to make sure you eat or else you would die. Similarly, we involved in uh, in a situation where there wasn't too much information. So anything that you encountered was something that you could take in and think about. 
now we live in, uh, in an era of overabundance, uh, both in terms of nutrition, but also in terms of information. And so I think just like you think carefully about the things that you put in your mouth, you should think carefully about the things that you put in your mind. Uh, and, and more is not always better. Um, so I'd rather eat better food, have better information, um, than just have uh, so much that I feel sick to my stomach and sick in my head. <laughs> well, I don't know if any of you are going to watch this program, but I'm sure I'm glad that you came on and to share your views with us. Adam Mastroianni, Colette Brin, Amanda Ripley, thanks so much for spending so much time with us on TVO tonight. We're grateful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.